This is 2015. The century has gone since uh, general relativity was first introduced. And I thought it'd be worth just talking a little bit about how Einstein was really quite resistant to the idea that the universe is expanding. And he worked very hard to stop it. It ultimately failed and he ultimately accepted that it failed, but it's quite interesting to see the effort he put in to actually make the universe static and then the consequence of that today, um, the term that he introduced to make the universe static, looks like it's, it's around today and driving the acceleration of the universe, which is a kind of an irony. You know, around 1915, if you, what, what was astronomy telling us? Well, astronomy, you'd look out in the night sky and you'd see night after night the stars and you might see uh, the Andromeda with your, your eye. Kind of understandably to me, it, it, it seems that Einstein thought the universe was static. He also had reasons for wanting it to be static. He believed the universe on large scales had to be homogeneous and isotropic. It, it kind of it looked the same every, in all directions and we were in no special place in the universe. Albert Einstein wasn't a caveman. Like He didn't no. look up at the stars and think they were little points of light. He saw beyond skin deep. So surely he didn't look up at the yeah, but, night sky and think, oh, it has to always be the same. But people didn't know what the universe looked like beyond our Milky Way. Why would you have the universe expanding if you don't see it, if you don't see any evidence of it, in fact, his beautiful equations, it must have been a nightmare for him when he began to look at them and other people quickly began to look at them in 1915, it must have been a nightmare for him when he discovered actually he can't have it static as he'd written it down. It just would not stay static. What do the equations do? The left-hand side of the equations relate the curvature of space and the, to the matter content of the universe. And so you, you, have, you have this situation where the two are intrinsically connected so that if the matter evolves it will affect the curvature of the space-time in which it's evolving and as the curvature of space-time evolves it actually determines the trajectory that the matter takes. So let me draw two galaxies. So here's two galaxies, okay. I'm going to give them a, a separation and to make life simple this, is, this should be A of T, right? So a is known as the scale factor and it tells me about the the rate at which the space-time is, eva is evolving, right? And it's this that Einstein didn't want to evolve because he didn't think that this, there was any movement in the space-time itself. He just thought that the, the universe was nice and static. So if you've got A of t, then just let me, let's just define a couple of terms for us. If I call it A dot, the rate of change of A, let me call it a, a velocity type term, right? It's telling me about how this scale factor is changing with time. That's how does distance change with time, that's a velocity. And if I introduce an A double dot, then that's like the acceleration term, okay? That's telling me how the rate of change of the velocity. What would a static universe mean? A static universe would be one that where A is a constant. A dot would equal A double dot which would equal zero. There'd be no acceleration because if there was acceleration it would generate a velocity. So why does this not work? Why did Einstein realize this? In fact, I think Lemaitre pointed out it wasn't going to work. There are two major equations that you can write down from Einstein's uh, theory of relativity that apply to cosmology. Two really neat equations. So I'll write down the, the first the first of these which is useful is called the acceleration equation. So it tells me how a double dot divided by a and it's given in terms of, funnily enough, Newton's constant. So there's 4 pi g. g is Newton's constant over 3. And then it has these two contributions. It's got a term which I'll call rho. And then it has another term which I'll call p. And in fact, c squared is the speed of light, OK? Rho is the density of matter, the energy density of matter. So any matter in the universe will contribute some energy density, rho. So as long as the universe has got matter in there, then rho is non-zero. P is the pressure of that matter. And for, for the, a universe made up of particles like you and I that are not moving very rapidly, if you just think about how particles, you know, pressure is the force per unit area, these particles hardly do anything. So the pressure is effectively zero. But the key thing is rho is non-zero. So if I have a universe with matter, then it tells me that rho is not equal to zero and that then immediately tells me because it means the, the right hand side of here is non-zero. So a double dot is not equal to zero and Einstein's had it. 
the universe is going to evolve. When Einstein was looking at this, he knew the universe was mainly made up of matter. You know, you could look at the stars. We knew matter was dominating, so it's the leading term here. In fact, radiation can only add to this. It would just make it even worse. <laughs> so it, it was clear that the, the universe had this, had this problem. It, 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 it seemed as if it was going to um, evolve. And, and so what Einstein did was he, real, he decided that there was another term well, he knew there was another term which he, he hadn't been adding to his equations, but if he added them to his equations, he could actually sort this issue out. But th isn't this a bit like if I always want Brazil to win games of soccer and they lose 3-0, I just invent a new term where Brazil always get an extra four goals right, in every as, game? As long as your new term was consistent with what your original rules were. Right, that's the key thing. He, his, this term that he's going to add, this cosmological constant term, is perfectly consistent with the underlying principles that he had, which for, that developed developed into general relativity. So he didn't just tack a number on the end. No, say no, like, no. Okay, and let's put minus eight on there. No, I, th I think he just thought, for reasons which I, you know, I don't know, I, he presumed that it wasn't there when he was originally thinking it, it was zero for some reason. In fact. He probably had no right to think that. He probably should be thinking all the time, why, why don't I include it? So he did include it. Actually, it affects this equation, but I'll, I'll do that in a second. Let me write down the second equation, which is known as the Friedman equation, and that tells me about the, how the velocity evolves. Okay, so this is called the Hubble parameter, by the way, the a dot over a. So this is actually given by the following. It's given by that energy density again, with Newton's constant in there. And then I can add in a new term, which is, this, this is my cosmological constant, lambda. These factors of three are just to make life simpler. And then there, there is another term which is going to be important, and this tells me about the curvature of my universe. This is the A, by the way, this, this scale factor, okay? This is known as the Friedman equation. There are three terms. This is my energy density the, of, the, of the matter that I'm thinking about. This is my cosmological constant term. Lambda is a constant. And this term K represents the curvature of the spatial curvature of the universe because it turned out there are three possibilities that, that are consistent with Einstein's original idea that the universe is homogeneous and isotropic. One is if K is positive, and that's known as a closed universe. So the universe is finite in spatial extent. It, it grows to a big, to a fine, fixed size and then collapses again. The second, which is what it looks like the universe looks like, is flat. This is a spatially infinite universe. If I was on a 2D plane, it would just look like this and go on and on and on forever. And the third is if K is negative, and this is known as an open universe, which you can think of, it's, it's, it's a bit like a saddle, and, a, and it's also infinite. So we have these three types of universe, all consistent, and I, he, he just wrapped them all up in this general K. Oh, and by the way, the, the, this term, the K, doesn't appear in the acceleration equation, including the lambda term. Then the acceleration equation now becomes what it was before, minus 4 pi g upon 3 into rho plus um, 3p over c squared. And then finally, I, it, this lambda term is there. It appears in this acceleration equation. Now, remember what I need. What Albert wanted was he wanted a dot and a double dot to be zero. So I just set the left-hand side of this equation and this equation to be zero. So if I do it here, Remember, I'm saying that p equals zero for, because we, we're thinking of this as a universe dominated by matter. So, uh, not in particular non-relativistic matter, like, like you and I are made of. So if I set a double dot to be equal to zero, then I have a simple equation. The threes cancel, and I have an equation for lambda. It just tells me that lambda is equal to 4 pi g times the energy density in the matter divided by c squared. If he tune, tunes lambda so it exactly matches the energy density, then it will give a universe that doesn't accelerate. What does it mean for the, if you like, the velocity, the Friedman equation? So I also need a dot to equal zero. So I go back to my Friedman equation and I substitute in. You can, can you see that I can substitute in for the lambda term here, replace the rho with lambda, and I get the following expression, 2 over 3 
lambda c squared from the, for the from this ex, from this term plus lambda c squared upon three from that minus k c squared over a squared equals zero. So I now have a solution that tells me that lambda minus k over a squared equals zero. So that's telling me that a static universe requires k which is equal to lambda a squared to be positive because lambda is positive, the energy density is positive so this must be positive. So this is telling me so Einstein's, for Einstein's solution to work for him to stop the universe from expanding he had to make it a positively curved universe with a cosmological constant. I think Brady's going to stop me doing any more maths but I've got one Pro more. Professor Copeland, before we started, said, can I do equations? I promise I'll just do two very simple ones. <laughs> this is what we're on so far. <laughs> so I won't, go into the <laughs> I won't go into the stability, but here's the, here's the neat thing. We've got the universe. We've, we've made it static. He did this in 1917. Right? It, it, as far as I can tell, it, it predated any of the cosmology-related papers which demonstrated the universe was... Um, expanding the, the papers of, I think De Sitter may have written one before that, but Lemaitre and Friedman, they all came later with their papers. And yet they were coming in saying there, there are all these other solutions, which we're not going to go into, we, but you, we saw it right at the beginning there. If we, if we don't have that cosmological constant and we don't have the curvature to balance it, then the universe will evolve. So there were all these evolving universe solutions out there. And he just didn't like them. He just said, he, he, initially he thought there were some mistakes made in some of the papers. The Friedman uh, solution he, he thought was wrong, but then he realized it was right. But he said, basically he said, it's a correct solution, but I think it's just part of your, you know, it's one of these weird, wonderful solutions which this beautiful system of equations has, but is irrelevant. Lemaitre had a solution, which Einstein said, your solution's correct, but your physics is rubbish effectively and so he just wouldn't buy it but you know at the same time as all of this was happening astronomers like Slipher were doing observations of distant nebula and they were beginning to see evidence of, of, of the light from these distant nebula being redshifted. Einstein didn't accept this as part of evidence that the universe must be doing something on these very large scales. Then of course in the 20s Hubble turned his attention to this and he started looking at distant galaxies and he realized the distant galaxies are moving apart. The A of T that we're talking about here, that these galaxies are moving apart on very large scales. And he came up with this law, which is that basically the velocity of, of, that they were moving apart was proportional to their separation. So the further away they were, the faster they were moving. Other than looking at the night sky, mm. What was Einstein basing this assumption on? We, we, we famously always get told, never assume, never assume anything. For him, the underlying criteria which he was using to sort of come up with the, the, the thought that the universe is homogeneous and isotropic on large scales was known as Marx principle, which was a principle that sort of suggests that features on large scales determine what we see on small scales, is one way of thinking about it. And on small scales, we weren't seeing anything evolving. And so the features on large scales shouldn't be really evolving either. I think that is kind of where this came from. I'm not, I'm not sure. There's no value on the cosmological constant. It's not like it's not like pi or Hubble's constant. It's not a value that's coming out of some fundamental theory which says, yeah, lambda is equal to pi over e or something. But you can see from this equation here, well, you you mock my equations, but you now can now see that the lambda depends upon whatever the density of matter is in the universe. So that's like, if you like an observational fact. You would measure that density, that mean density, and you would set that would be what your lambda and then, is. And then the cosmological constant would come out as eight. <laughs> yes, it would be a number. Yeah, and, and some units. So you've got this solution, right? Now what you do in, 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 at college when you, when you have a solution is you ask, one, one obvious question to ask about a solution is, is it stable? Right? In other words, if I have a static solution here for A, what happens if I just hit it? You know, is it with what? Just perturb it. With what? Well, in this case, what you're perturbing is the density of matter. You're, you're letting the density of matter vary ever so slightly. So in a static universe, of course, it's a constant because it's not evolving. But imagine I just let it vary ever so slightly with time. So it's, not, it's a constant plus a little bit. And then you can ask, well, what does that do to the evolution of this scale factor? Does it somehow move and yet then go back to its original position so the static universe returns? That might be the, the analogue of a, a ball 
going at the bottom of a colander, right? If, so its stable point, you think, is at the bottom, and then you, but you perturb it slightly. You push it up and then let it go, and then, of course, what happens is it just oscillates slightly and goes to the bottom. However, on the other hand, imagine that you had a pencil and you were careful enough that you could put the pencil sharp end up. And then you, you know that if I perturb that slightly, just a little hit, it will, go, it will fall flat. It, that's an unstable situation. And what really surprised me it, was that it wasn't until 1930 when Eddington published a paper. He said, what happens if I perturb the matter density ever so slightly, what is the consequence it has on this scale factor? And he found that a small fluctuation in the matter caused A of T to act, not to simply oscillate around its fixed point and then come back, which is a stable solution. It either grew exponentially fast or it decreased exponentially fast. It either went off to infinity or shot down towards zero. You've got the evidence coming from Hubble in 1920s, from Slipher earlier, that the universe is ex seems to be ex expanding. Einstein didn't want to accept it. You then have Eddington showing that Einstein's own solution is unstable. And then Einstein came and gave a lecture here. I don't think it was in German. No, there's no record of the lecture, except we have that wonderful blackboard which he signed on the 30th of June 1930 and that would be still before Eddington had managed to collar him and ear bash him into it, saying actually your solution's unstable. I just think it's nice that within a few months of, of weeks even of him being here he was actually beginning to accept the universe is expanding. But it is strange that it's 13 years after his original work. If I could conjure up Einstein and bring him into the room now Yes, please. What would, what would you ask him? What would you want to know? Or has, has science moved on so much that he would be left behind now and he'd have to go and read a few books to catch up on what, what's been built on? Oh, he'd have huge to, to contribute. If he'd be happy to go back and think about GR. There is so much we've yet to really understand about general relativity. There's a mass of stuff that is yet to be uncovered. There's, and Einstein would be the guy to ask, I'm sure. <laughs> Why did he not do it at the time then? Did, um, is it because he died or he, no, he lost no, interest? No, you or? know, it's a bit, kind of a little bit sad in that after the, so this 1931 paper he wrote on, with the sitter was his final paper in cosmology. And I think soon after that he began to, th his, his, his attention turned to this idea of unifying the forces. And he, that's where he put plowed most of his energies. I mean, it must have been also the fact that he was a major celebrity. I mean, truly major celebrity, right? He was all over the place, sort of giving talks and being invited to places. But his own research seemed to move into this area of unifying the forces. And, and that, as it has with many people, led him up dead ends. And, and so I think it's fair to say for the, that there's not much of that work that has survived today. People don't refer to much of that work. He did some fantastic things in the 30s on quantum mechanics. And that's actually beginning to come back as people think about things like quantum information. But in terms of GR, in terms of those, this wonderful set of equations, he kind of left them for a while and, and never came back to them. And that's why I say if he comes back and we could persuade him to work on GR, yeah, it would be wonderful. I'm very privileged to see this and to realize that even famous scientists like Einstein couldn't really use the blackboard very clearly and so I might have had difficulty to follow the lecture